This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This week, I'm delighted to welcome back champion of the soil food web, Jeff Lowenfels. Jeff is the author of the Teeming With series of books, which look at what goes on at a micro level in the soil beneath our feet. His new title, Teeming With Bacteria, lifts the lid on new findings about how plants use and interact with bacteria, and he's here to give us the lowdown on this amazing relationship. He starts off talking about his journey into the soil food web. I am extremely immersed in the soil food web, and I wrote a book in 2006 called Teeming With Microbes, which basically described how the soil food web works. It was a soil food web that had been researched and developed by a phenomenal scientist named Dr. Elaine Ingham. And basically, it explained how plants attracted bacteria and fungus. They attracted protozoa and nematodes who ate the bacteria and fungus, pooped out the excess, and fed the plant. That excess was plant nutrient available elements. So that was the soil food web. In 2006, then people started to discover mycorrhizal fungi, and mycorrhizal fungi actually enter into the root and go out and get food in the soil and bring it to the plant and in return get these foods from the plant so that the fungi can live. And so that was a second book, Teeming with Fungi. That was about 2015 or so. And then I discovered through the internet uh, that there was a new discovery called rhizophagy. Rhizophagy was a system discovered in Australia. They weren't quite sure how it, it happened, but bacteria seemed to enter into plant roots. And they called it rhizophagy, which makes it sound like root eating That's what they thought was sort of going on. They lost their funding, and a gentleman in New Jersey, in the United States, picked up the research and continued it and discovered that these bacteria actually go into the plant, go into the very, very young root cells, and essentially nourish the plant from inside. They're stripped of their cell walls by the plant. The idea is that the nutrients in the cell walls are used by the plant. In order to protect themselves, the bacteria spray the plant cell wall and creates a series of reactions that results in those very same bacteria fixing nitrogen inside the plant cells. Wow. So these are some of the same bacteria that are attracted by the exudates, as described in 2006, only these don't get eaten. They go into the plant and they produce nitrogen inside the plant. Now, it gets even more exciting because, again, there's some series of chemical reactions. But what results is a multiplication of these bacteria inside the plant root to the point where there are so many of them that the plant cell expels them. And in doing so, they need to create root hairs. It turns out that root hairs are literally there so that the plant can expel these bacteria. The bacteria go out of these root hairs, and sometimes there can be four or five explosions opening up the root hair as it grows. Once the bacteria get back in the soil, they regrow their cell wall, they renourish themselves, and then they go back in a couple of days later into a new root cell and repeat the process. So root hairs, while they may gain surface area so that a plant can pick up nutrients, are actually there to eject bacteria into the soil. This is called rhizophagy, and it really blew my mind. So I wrote a book. And the gentleman's name, incidentally, in New Jersey is Dr. James White, and he's at Rutgers University. And he's basically, he's got a new branch that supplements what Dr. Elaine Ingham originally wrote about. Brilliant. That is quite mind-blowing, because as you say, I think a lot of people think root hairs are there to kind of increase surface area for nutrient uptake. I can guarantee you we all did. 
Yeah, I mean, it is it is quite mind-blowing what you talk about in the book and how the bacteria work. But to, to kind of taking it back to basics, what is bacteria? Oh, okay. What is bacteria? That's a great question. Bacteria are these single-cell organisms that contain all sorts of little organelles, DNA, uh, things to gather food, uh, sexual organs. Uh, they're little teeny organisms. Uh, uh, about uh, maybe a hundred times less than a hair. Uh, if you Google bacteria head of a needle, you'll see these bacteria on the tip of a of a pin or a needle. And I couldn't use the picture because it was too expensive to put in the book, but uh, you can get it for free by Googling it. You'll see that they're everywhere. They are multiplying every 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, they do all sorts of things. In our instance, what we're interested in is their ability to be able to fix nitrogen and uh, to feed these plants through the process. So so bacteria are literally everywhere. Uh, many of us in the United States believe in something called the five-second rule. If you drop something on the floor that you're eating, you've got five seconds to pick it up. No, 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 no. There are so many bacteria. They are literally everywhere. They're in raindrops. They're in snow. They cause snowflakes to form. They're just these amazing organisms. So the first part of the book explains bacteria and how they operate, because you need to know that, and gives the reader some of the biology and some of the chemistry that's necessary in order to understand the second half of the book, which is about, first of all, this rhizophagy cycle. And second of all, about other bacteria that also enter the plant, not necessarily in the same root zone, but enter into the plant, move through the plant, and produce things that the plant needs in return for the plant giving them a safe haven inside them. So those are called endophytic bacteria inside the plant. These rhizophagy bacteria are endophytic, but this is a second class of endophytic bacteria that do various things to help the plant. They have the capability of producing hormones that the plant would normally have to produce itself, and these hormones cause the plant to be able to do all sorts of wonderful things. So that's what the book is essentially about. So when the bacteria go towards a plant, is it just a passive process? Does the plant just let it in without any kind of resistance or without selectively choosing which bacteria it lets in? Yeah, it's a very interesting process. And to put it down on the micro level, what happens is these bacteria are in the soil, again, attracted by the plant because the plant produces these exudates. And again, instead of being eaten by a protozoa or a nematode and pooped out as nutrients, uh, the, the bacteria smells a popcorn smell <laughs> uh, and moves towards the plant. The plant literally attracts and invites the bacteria to push through these young meristem root walls. And that's what they do. They smell that popcorn. They go towards it. They leave their their little slime area, and they move right in, and they enter into this area called a paraplasmic space. Now, I don't know about uh, England, Great Britain, but in the United States, we buy tofu in these special cartons that are plastic with water in the inside and then a chunk of tofu floating in it. Do you have that there? Yes, we do, and I've just had some for dinner. Okay, well, there you go. So if you'll imagine that the root cell is that package of tofu, the bacteria travel through the hard plastic into that liquid, which is called a periplasmic space, but it doesn't go into the tofu itself. Not much of it. Some of them do, but mostly it stays in the periplasmic space and they're circulated. There's a motion that goes around and around and around circulating these bacteria inside that cell. So they're attracted in and then they're circulated and they're sprayed in order to strip off that wall and to start the cascade of the bacteria literally fixing nitrogen. Now, gardeners should understand nitrogen fixation. We use something called rhizobia uh, when we plant legumes, peas and beans. This rhizobia forms little nodules in the roots and produces nitrogen, which the plant then uses. These are 
a different system. But the upshot of all of this is that all of the people that are making fertilizer now are looking at this rhizobia-like effect of these endophytic bacteria that are inside the plant and these rhizophagy bacteria that are inside the plant to do the work that would normally be done by a pesticide or an herbicide. Let the bacteria do what the plant needs to be done. Now, this is going to require tremendous amounts of research. It's going on right now. It's fascinating, the shift that is taking place. And if you've never heard of rhizophagy and endophytic bacteria, uh, you need to team with them uh, by reading the book and then sit back and watch the horticultural, gardening, ag, and silviculture world catch up to you because this is really a brand new phenomenon. The book has only been out about four months now. Rhizophagy was discovered in about 2010 and really wasn't perfected until about 2019 or 20. So this is brand new stuff. And the implications go even beyond that. Uh, you know, I could talk forever. You can hardly shut me up, as you can tell. The trichomes on a plant, be it a uh, tomato plant, for example, which has those hairs, those trichomes, or be it a cannabis plant, literally contain bacteria that are fixing nitrogen. And in the case of cannabis, in order to fix that nitrogen, you've got to have a oxygen-free area. And so the plant trichome sprays the bacteria with cannabinoids, which give the plant its unique substances. It's, it's a fascinating brand new discovery that's being developed like crazy. And slowly, this stuff will, will be entering into the gardening world. You can already buy uh, certain bacillus bacteria that will mimic some of the things that you want fertilizer to do. There are other, other products that are on the market that help fungal feed the bacteria. There's all sorts of stuff that's coming, and it's really the future. So I'm quite interested in the whole kind of dating process between the bacteria and the plants. As I was reading your book, I was thinking, you know, can any bacteria live in any plant? And what are the chances of the correct bacteria finding its host plant? Right. A great question. And really, the answer is evolution has created a situation where the right bacteria are attracted by the exudates that the plant creates. Now, that's in a natural system. In an artificial system, the goal will be to be able to add exactly the right kind of bacteria that would exist in the natural system that feeds the plant. So the signals that the plant sends out to attract the bacteria and protozoa, those exudates, are specifically designed to attract specific bacteria and fungi. So that would include the mycorrhizal fungi as well as these endophytic rhizophagy bacteria. We think these plants are these inanimate dumb objects that just sit there, but they, they have developed over time the ability to attract what they need because they can't walk over and get it or hunt it. And so these exudates are quite specific. And on the realm that we're talking about with bacteria, very powerful. And again, given the numbers of bacteria and fungi to a lesser extent, there's quite a world out there that we can't see and don't understand uh, until we start reading books about these things that have some of these early pictures. So not because I'm going to make any money off of these things, but it, because I want everybody to be a better gardener and grower. This teeming series of books really lays out the soil food web and how to use it for yourself. So, for example, the idea of not rototilling, that comes from the idea of preserving the soil food web, not breaking up all the fungi that are in there, not displacing these bacteria that have been attracted to the root zone, you know, by rototilling it all up. It's why we shouldn't be sterilizing seeds because the seeds, it turns out, contain the bacteria that the plant really needs. So to go back to your dating question, uh, what happens is uh, these bacteria eventually work their way up into the flower. As the flower forms the seed, the bacteria are trapped, and then you've got a seed that's got bacteria in it. And so when you plant the seed, 
wherever you plant the seed, it's got the right kind of bacteria in it to help the plant germinate and to feed the plant and help it grow, either through rhizophagy or through uh, some other endophytic activity that occurs, uh, you know, in other places of the plant. It's really a beautiful, beautiful system. And I spoke in England about, oh, gee, you know, it must have been about three or four years before COVID. And my sense was this stuff is new and that it's just slowly getting through the idea of mycorrhizal fungi. I, I hope you're able to buy it now at your local nurseries. You couldn't 10 years ago. I know you can buy the rhizobia bacteria. Will you be able to buy the bacillus? Well, you know, we got to get a lot of people to read the books and to demand these products because they work, they're natural, and they make it so much easier to grow and garden because you're teeming with the microbes. They're doing the work. I'm assuming that the bacteria that might be needed by a plant can persist in the soil without a plant being present. Is that right? Well, in some instances, it is. Uh, in some instances, the plant has to carry the bacteria with it to that soil. I, I'm trying to remember this because it's been a while. I used to I used to give a, a lot of in-person talks, but COVID cut that out. And and I remember, in fact, I remember talking about this in England. It doesn't matter whether you're in England. I think I spoke to the Soil Society. Whether you're in England or whether you're in, uh, you know, Anchorage, Alaska, uh, there's a certain base of bacteria that are in all soils. And I think it was like they discovered 608 basic kinds of bacteria they find all around the world wherever plants grow. Uh, and then you add to that the bacteria that jump off the seed. And I, I, you know, I can't diminish those bacteria. There are studies that show that a corn, a 400-year-old corn, grown today after all, you know, all these 400 years, still has the same bacteria jumping off the seed that it had 400 years ago. Oh, my goodness. This is where terror comes from, in a sense. The idea of growing an heirloom tomato. Well, why would you do that? Well, you would do that so that eventually that tomato collects the bacteria in the seed that makes it an heirloom that you could plant elsewhere, but it's still the heirloom that you grew in your, you know, London backyard plot. It's fascinating stuff. It is. It really is. And it's a bit mind blowing. But you talk about kind of seeds needing a particular bacteria. Does that imply that a plant might change the bacteria that it takes up across its life cycle, depending on what stage it's at? I'm sure the plant does take up different bacteria during the life cycle, but the seeds that it wants to pass on, well, I guess I really don't know the answer to that, but it's, it's just logical. It starts out with the right seeds and it keeps them viable so that as it produces seed for the next generation, those important bacteria continue on. And also, if you sowed a seed that came from, I don't know, somewhere else other than your own location, does that then mean that if you introduce a new plant that's growing from a seed that has a different bacteria, might that change your soil makeup? And, and is that a good thing? Yeah, you know, it probably does change your soil makeup. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because these are beneficial bacteria. But we have to remember that the numbers are phenomenal. Again, I urge people to look on the internet under images, head of a needle and bacteria. And, and the numbers are phenomenal. And so when you introduce on a seed bacteria into the soil of your garden or of a pot, it's like, can I use this term? It's like pissing into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, right in that little area, you might have some pee, but it's going to dilute itself pretty quickly. Right. Again, the numbers are something that we have trouble appreciating. It goes beyond being in, you know, uh, Trafalgar Square, you know, uh, Guy Fox Day, you know, what I mean, in terms of numbers. it's uh, People should be thinking about the parking lot at an airport with the cars representing bacteria as opposed to your car in the driveway in a flat. It's not one. It's the gazillions, numbers that we can't even fathom or think about. So that also made me think, if you've got one plant species, say you've got a concentration of that one species, and then presuming that the bacteria comes from in the seed, you've got that one plant species and their related bacteria species in one place, and that if you had more of those in one place, that might be a good thing. And yet monocrops aren't necessarily the healthiest populations. So how does that kind of tally? 
Well, you mean monocrops of bacteria or monocrops of plant? Of plants, yeah. Well, that's what agriculture is. And if people could figure out a better way to be sustainable with a monoculture, in other words, keep a monoculture area alive, you know, then maybe it's not such a bad thing. And uh, manipulating the bacterial input might be the answer to that. I mean, you're right. Generally, monocultures, they're not sustainable. But no. I think we might be able to, or the right people might be able to figure out how to make it sustainable by adding different kinds of bacterial stuff. And and what's so exciting about this to me is, first of all, I'm a, as you can tell, I'm a soil food web freak. I love this stuff. I mean, Dr. Elaine Ingham uh, came up with with a beautiful system, and she would have added rhizophagy had, had she had the microscopic capabilities. Those microscopes that discovered rhizophagy didn't exist back in the late 1990s and in the early 2000s. But the whole concept is right at a cliff. You've got a cell phone that's capable of identifying your plants right now. I'm convinced in five or 10 years, that, that same cell phone is going to be capable of identifying bacteria. We already have a database of, of basically all the bacteria in soil. And you can send in a sample of soil uh, for a lot of money and get a reading or a listing of what bacteria are in that soil based upon the mRNA that, you know, that, that are in the sample that you send in. In five or 10 years, my goodness gracious, you know, we're going to be able to point that phone at a water sample, perhaps, and it'll tell us what's there. Or there'll be a gadget we can attach to our phone if the future continues the way the past has that you'll be able to use to become a better gardener by being able to test what kind of bacteria you have. Here's a good example. It turns out that some plants do better with thermal compost, which has one kind of a bacterial mix, versus plants that grow in a vermi compost, which doesn't have the heat and has a different kind of bacterial mix. Our job is to figure out which plants grow better and which, and then to spread that word. It's interesting that you mentioned water as well, because I was thinking, obviously, you've said the soil food web. And I wondered how these bacteria can exist in a hydroponic system. Are they waterproof? Do they work in that system? Well, I guess my answer to that is if the plant has root hairs, then it has bacteria. Pretty simple. Yeah. I mean, again, and it's sort of an astonishing thing. Let me and let me go back to that root hair. What happens is these bacteria they get their wall stripped off as they're in that paraplasmic space circulating around. They produce ethylene, which is part of the chemical process that enables them to protect themselves from being completely eaten up by the spray from the cell wall of the plant. And that ethylene is circulated as they circulate around in this cyclosis that happens. And it gets spread around. And that's great because ethylene in a plant, it's a plant hormone, it causes the cell to sort of elongate a little bit. But as these bacteria multiply and every 20 minutes they duplicate themselves, they get to be so many of them that they get caught up against the plant cell wall, that ethylene doesn't get circulated, that ethylene gets concentrated in that one spot, and the ethylene causes a tube to form in the cell. That plant hair is part of the original root cell. It's not a separate cell. It's part of the original cell. It's just a, a tube that formed in the wall as a result of all of this ethylene. Am I getting too freaky and too deep down into the weeds in this? Not at all. But as you say, this is so brand new. And some people might think, wow, this is so interesting, something I want to learn more about. And in that vein, are there any kind of simple and practical things that people can do to help the plant bacteria relationship just in their gardens? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, and again, I'm, I'm pushing the book, but you really, people need to read Teeming with Microbes first. That's the first book. And then skip over Teeming with Fungi, go right to Teeming with Bacteria, then read Teeming with Fungi, and then read Teeming with Nutrients if you want. But what you can do is not rototill. You can not sterilize your seeds. You can store your seeds with the oxygen because these bacteria, you know, don't store them in an airtight container. That's what we've always been told. They need a little bit of oxygen uh, so that the bacteria continue to live. Uh, you don't fertilize uh, with anything that's not organic. 
you try to prepare your soil at the end of the growing season in anticipation of the upcoming season by putting down all of your organic nutrients right after the plants are harvested. You don't pull plants out of the ground because if you pull plants out of the ground, you end up pulling out a lot of the bacteria and a lot of the extra dates and goodies and certainly a lot of the biochemical stuff that's in those extra dates. Well, you know, why get rid of that? Just cut the plant. What else? You use a mulch in order to continually feed the bacteria. If your plants prefer a heavier fungal element, things that are in the ground a longer period of time, like a little bit more fungal, then you can happily provide the right kind of mulch for them. So there are all sorts of things. There's actually 19 rules at the back of Teeming with Microbes that carry forward on all the other things in order to protect the mycorrhizal fungi in order to protect the bacteria that you need to know. There were 20 rules. The publisher took the last rule out because it was don't share these books, make people go out and buy their own. And they didn't think that was funny. <laughs> Well, I do. So if you had a plant that you were planting, would it make sense to incorporate the soil taken from a place where that species of plant is already growing successfully in order to kind of inoculate the soil? Would that be a good yes. idea? Yeah, that's a terrific idea. You can make your soil perfect for the kind of plant you want to grow. And essentially, that's what, that, you know, that's what Dr. Ingham did. She, she found, you know, if a banana grew great in this particular kind of soil, she studied that soil and was able to recommend to people, if you want to grow bananas, this is the kind of soil you need. She was interested in the ratio of fungus to bacteria, or fungal bacteria ratio, uh, which you can measure now using an instrument called a microbiometer which you can find at www.microbiometer.com. And you can, for about five bucks, measure the ratio between bacteria and fungus. Things that are in the ground for less than a year need more bacteria. Things that are in the ground for more than a year need more fungal. You know, again, there's a lot of practical application to this stuff. This is how plants grow. This is the science behind organic gardening. And if you know the science... It doesn't matter what kind of plant you're growing, you can figure it out, what it needs and, and what's wrong with it or, or why it's doing so great, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to come on to what this means for the future of gardening. But first off, one of the things that struck me reading the book was, is there the potential for somebody to patent a strain of bacteria and stop someone else cultivating and commercializing it? Yeah, I think there is. And I think there have been some that have already been patented even by the U.S. government. So, yeah, that's something we've got to keep an eye on. You know, we certainly don't want people greenwashing, which is, you know, uh, getting a bacteria that works and then patenting it and then not letting the public use it. But it's, you know, we've got to be real careful about this stuff. We've got to make sure that it's accessible and transparent to everybody. So what do you think this research means for the future of gardening and plant growing? You know, you're quite good at seeing the bigger picture and extrapolating. What direction might this take? Well, I think we're going to see a couple of things that are really, really important. One, I believe we're going to see the end of pesticides and herbicides as we know them. They'll all be replaced by bacteria or fungus. There's already a bacteria that I've been told about that jumps off a plant in a lawn and can kill a dandelion next to it and then jump back into the plant again. Oh, wow, that'll be a big seller. There are all sorts of people studying how to get nitrogen fixation in wheat. Certainly the rhizophagy cycle is something they want to be looking at. They probably don't know about it, uh, but they also want to look at endophytic bacteria inside the wheat, which they probably are studying other than the rhizophagy. We're going to see this stuff on a home gardener level uh, instead of going in and buying you know, a chemical. You'll go in and buy a, a bacteria, et cetera. It's going to be very interesting. A lot of things that have to be overcome. How do you how do you keep these things viable? Some things you've got to keep alive, alive. Some things you can allow to go into a dormancy and then wake them up again. It's going to result in no tilling anymore. Much more sustainable uh, food growing. We're losing our soil at a phenomenal rate, uh, and by converting from all of these chemicals that destroy the microbial life which forms the basis of soil structure, we're going to be able to keep the soil by not rototilling. We're going to be able to keep the soil. The benefits are unbelievable. It all sounds very positive, actually. So that's a really good thing. Jeff, that's the end of my questions. If anyone wants to find out more about you or the book, where can they go? 
Well, they can certainly look me up on Amazon, Google. You know, they've got this author section. Uh, there's a website, uh, jefflowenfels.com, which they can look at, although I very rarely change any of it because I can't figure out how to do it. I'm an old man and this doesn't come easy to me. Or they can just email me at jeff at gardener.com. As you can tell, you can hardly shut me up about this stuff. It's something I, I love to talk about. And one of these days, I, I, you know, I hope to get over to England, make a little tour and, and, and see if we can't spread the word so that people are into this and we can start saving soil over there the same way we're, we're saving soil in places like Alaska, where people all soil food web garden. The more we learn about the soil food web, the better we can grow plants in a way that minimizes inputs and maximizes the natural processes at work. So thank you to Jeff for highlighting this area of horticulture and for sharing that knowledge with us again. Thank you to you for listening. Don't forget, if you're interested in this area, check out Jeff's Teaming With series of books. And you can also listen to Jeff talking about mycorrhizal fungi in a previous episode, the links to which are in the show notes. Now for Dr. Ian Bedford, talking about a bug that you've no doubt been seeing emerge in your garden this past couple of weeks, if you live in the UK. When winter arrives, the frenetic sound of insects that'll have resonated around our gardens during the warmer months will fade away. As many of these creatures go into a state of suspended animation that we call their winter dormancy or hibernation. The part of their life when their metabolism slows to barely tick over whilst they rest hidden away from harmful ice and frosts until the following spring. And one of the first sounds that we'll hear again in spring will be the buzzing of bees the queen bumblebees, who, having come back to life, will be out searching for somewhere safe to build a nest and start a colony. And the honeybee workers, who have spent the coldest winter days huddled together in their hives. But as the weeks progress, these social bees will be joined in our gardens by increasingly more bees that belong to the 250 species a solitary bee that can be found in Britain. Solitary, since they don't live in colonies that serve a queen, but build individual nests and, after mating, live alone. But the solitary bees differ from the social bumble and honey bees in other ways too, since they don't make honey or wax, are not territorial or aggressive, and are rarely known to sting. However, Despite being numerous, the solitary bees are far less likely to be recognised in our gardens, since many will look very similar to the social bees as they buzz and forage amongst the garden flowers. But they are much more likely to be using our gardens as a place to nest, and by recognising the signs of this, we could avoid disturbing them whilst the following generation develops out of sight for many months. Since solitary bees make their nests within holes that, depending on which species, are either excavated into the ground, mined into mortar, or in the hollow stems of plants, or even bamboo canes in purpose-built boxes. And so, seeing bees disappearing into holes during the warmer months of the year, laden with pollen, and perhaps carrying plant material, will reveal the location of their nest since these will be the female solitary bees building a chain of individually partitioned cells within the burrow or tube, each containing pollen soaked in nectar and an egg. Then when the nest is full of cells, the entrance is sealed with mud before the bee flies off to create another nest during the short few weeks of her life. Inside the cells though, larvae soon hatch from the eggs and consume the nectar-rich pollen before hibernating over winter. Awakening in spring to finish feeding, pupate, and then burrow out of the nests as adult bees throughout the warmer months. Despite their somewhat inconspicuous lives though, solitary bees are assumed to be the most important group of pollinating insects for wildflowers and native fruit-bearing trees which is one 
very good reason for us to provide or recognise and preserve safe nesting sites for solitary bees in our gardens each year. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.